Just bear with me, everyone. Uh, great, yes, you see a document, which is my disclaimer, the Forex.com disclaimer. I, uh, I just need to read out a few things before we get going today, guys. Just bear with me one moment. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, it's great that you're here. Um, and we're going to get going now. So just to, on this disclaimer, just to say that the information and opinions in this report, they're for general or in this webinar. For general information, you send in are not intended as an offer or solicitation with respect to the purchase of any sale or currency or CFD contract. Futures options on futures, uh, foreign exchange and other leveraged products, they involve significant risk of loss. And they're not suitable for all investors. Increasing leverage increases your risk. Spot gold and silver contracts, they're not subject to regulation under the U.S. Commodities Exchange Act. And contracts for difference, they're not available for U.S. residents due to regulatory reasons. So hopefully uh, that makes sense. Um, just need to put that up there. Um, and we will get going uh, very, very shortly. Hang on. Just uh, let me push a few things around here, get things a bit cleaner. And now you should be able to see a chart. That's not what I'm going to show you first. Instead, I'm going to show you Euro. And sorry, I've, I've stacked up a ton of things. I'm going to get rid of this one. I'm going to go on to an hourly chart. Um, because the first trading day, or the first European trading day, I should say, not in FX, obviously, but in, uh, in uh, certainly in um, in, uh, in in stocks, um, and largely, I, I'm, I'm sure some of you who were in uh, Europe probably weren't in today, in yesterday. Uh, you may not have been uh, been trading over the weekend or whatever, or over the the first day. The, 1st of April. Uh, so this is really the first trading day of the second quarter for Europe, for sure. And we've had a whole swathe of economic data to deal with, uh, not least, of course, Eurozone PMIs. And we also had Eurozone unemployment. So Eurozone unemployment, that, that rose to 12% to so another record. Uh, we had a slightly better than expected um, PMI reading, uh, the final PMI reading for March, but it really wasn't anything to write home about. And if anything, um, we actually saw further declines for Italy and Spain, um, and we saw uh, we saw the overall uh, the overall PMI manufacturing set to just edge up really slightly, 46.8 from 46.6, still incredibly weak, and. Um, Still incredibly weak. Let me just do uh, check. Yeah, so you know, going back, raising all of those gains that we got in January, um, and really uh, falling back to the pattern that we were in really last year. Um, so Ron has just asked me to talk about cable, and I will do that. Um, but just bear with me a moment, please. Um, so basically, what we've seen is Euro Euro traders certainly seem very, or they certainly look very. Um, uh, how shall I say it? They, they just seem very kind of disgruntled with what's going on, as you can see here. Quite pathetic rally up here. This is an hourly chart, remember. We got to kind of a high of 128.80, which also corresponds, by the way, with the 200-day moving average. So that's the 200-day moving average on the close, because I know, I know some of you kind of, or a lot of, um, not just you guys, but sometimes I see it when I'm reading things. Sometimes other clients come up to me and they're like, you're talking about 129, 128.80, and I'm seeing it as 128.60 or 129.10. Um, I, I, there are different ways of measuring your moving averages. I'm looking, when I talk about moving averages, I'm talking about it from the close pretty much. So, um, so that 129.80 level um, has been the... Um, the high that, that has been the high there, um, and we've since fallen somewhere, somewhat in somewhat to the lowest low levels of the day. They 128.30 held us very good support. We thought 128.80 will. When we get below the, the, there, these 127.70 lows, they were from yesterday. Um, they should hold. Uh, we would expect them to hold quite nicely because, of course, we are leading up to uh, the ECB meeting. And what have we seen in the past? Well, Draghi can be really kind of the master of the markets, and, and really uh, his words can have have such an impact on the markets that we think, um, obviously, we, we've digested a lot of economic data. Uh, the overall consensus has been that this has been weaker. We've dropped 50 pips already today. Um, and what we think, is, or what, what our view is now, that this week economic data, uh, data could actually make the prospect of more easing from the ECB a bit, a bit more of a reality. Because not only are we seeing weakness in the periphery, so, you know, your Spains, your Italy's, your Ireland, whatever else, we're also seeing it of course, in the core, so France,
France for sure, but even Germany doesn't look like it's escaped. So that is going to be important. Um, Add to that, we also had some quite weak inflation data coming out of Germany today, which again just seals the deal. Remember, Germany, when you talk about the ECB, the Bundesbank, the German Central Bank, very, very, um, very incredibly powerful um, on the German, in the the ECB, Um, but they were also real inflation hawks. They hate inflation. Obviously, they've got a history of hyperinflation, so um, that goes some way to explaining it. So they are very sensitive to price rises. So when prices are falling, that's probably when we're going to get the most dovish um, sentiments out of there. So we're not expecting necessarily any uh, policy change, but we do think that that, um, Draghi will probably continue to talk down the euro, because obviously a weaker euro is very good news for those, um, is is good news actually for um, exports, not just obviously in Germany, but also in the rest of the periphery. Now, how low could we go? Um, We just don't see uh, the, the fundamental uh, path in place right now for a meaningful recovery in Euro. Uh, we think the fundamentals are event- they're getting worse. They're not getting better. Um, Italy still doesn't have a government, even though it looks like it's going to have a technocratic government. So things could be quite stable there. But you know, we've we've talked about it. These markets actually focusing on um, fundamentals. And I'm going to show you something about the dollar um, in a little bit, which really highlights that. You know, it's the mar- all markets are focusing on fundamentals really. And right now, there's just no let up for the euro, and we think it's going to signal further losses. Um, now, we don't think we're going to kind of decline back to those June lows. Remember, uh, July lows, sorry, from 2012 back here. Remember, back there, we didn't have the ECB acting as kind of a stopgap. Um, but we do think that we could certainly meander lower back to those 126.60 lows. They were the lows from uh, November last year, even back towards 125. And that's because rather than the ECB having to um, intervene to stop a sovereign crisis, they now really need to intervene to stop an economic one. Um, so that's kind of the key thing. Now, Ron's waited very patiently. I'm going to swap back quickly to cable. Um, Ron was just asking, I'd ask your view about cable. If you have, t- it's like a double top. But where is the bottom of that pattern, please? It does look like a double top. Look at that. Well, the first um, thing to point out, I think, is maybe potentially your double bottom there, which, come, which came in just above 151. So 151.20, I would say, uh, would be the first downside. Uh, look at that there. I mean, you know, we had a kind of the, you know, a good tweezer top there at 152.60. Again, we've seen cable pull back today from 152.50. Uh, currently trading, just bear with you one minute. I'll just get you the up to date. Currently trading at 152, 152 actually, yeah, again, fallen back 50 pips just in the last kind of hour or so, or couple of hours, um, basically on the back of, um, you know, the quite weak economic data as well. In fact, we can see it slightly more better on the, on the hourly, as you can see, quite a sharp sell-off there. We are approaching, though, uh, Ron, this might be useful for you. I don't know your time zone, um, but in terms of, you know, well, how low could we go? As you can see here, there's like some nice, um, uh, I'm just going to go back quickly to that daily chart, just to show you kind of what I'm looking at when I go, when I magnify it and go back to the hourly, because here, as you can see, it's a real congestion zone. So you can see top there, 152, 8, 152, 70, 80. Uh, low there, kind of just around 151. Um, let's go down to the hourly, as you can see, because it will give you more incremental. Um, uh, sorry, Ray is just saying that my timing of my presentation was out by one hour. Um, no, it shouldn't have been. Um, I'd been very clear to FX Street that I wanted it at 10 o'clock BFT so that we didn't actually change anything. Um, maybe that was a problem with FX Street. So, Ray, we are sorry, but we were meant to stick from, we were switching from GMT to BST. Um, FX Street, maybe you can get in touch with them. Um, okay, so that's FX Street's fault because I had told them um, that we were meant to be there at uh, at 9 a.m. GMT is 10 o'clock BST. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Ray. Basically, GMT. Uh, we're now move, We've now moved from GMT to, to BST. Um, so we're, we're we're 10 o'clock UK time. So that is confusing, actually. Um, FX Street. Maybe if you could just kind of write that all down, or maybe put that on the profile, that would be greater. Uh, great. Thank you, Ray, for pointing that out. That's that's a good point. A lot of people, it is really confusing. I know it myself. But let's get back to cable quickly. 152.50, obviously, you know, you can see it by eye. We can go go above there, but the market doesn't like it above there in cable. That's that double top you were talking about, uh, Ron. And then on the downside, we, well, you know, we found fair, well, we could potentially find good support. We've already gone gone through that 55-hour moving average at 152.15. Now, that opens up to the 
is double, just in terms of incremental steps on the way down, 151.80. Um, one thing that I'm looking at um, as we as we talk about this, um, uh, one thing as we uh, as we as we look through this, uh, we've got a kind of a decline here. Obviously, you know, mirrors that decline that we've seen of the decline in the RSI. Sorry, the hourly RSI relative strength index, really good kind of oversold, overbought indicator suggests that 152.50 ish is where we get to oversold set territory. Um, and on the downside, uh, well, we're not in over. We're not in over, over. Sorry, overbought when we get to 152.50. We're not in oversold territory yet. We're still around 40. We need to get below 30 really for that. Um, but as you can see. It Real cl there's a whole cluster there of hourly moving averages, and I would expect them to act certainly as. Um, <clears throat> oh, brilliant! Well, I think I can just see a bit of a conversation going on there. So I think FX Street is, uh, is fixing all of that. So that that's great. But basically, it's always at 10 o'clock, even if it's GMT or BSC. It doesn't matter. It's always at 10. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, so. Um, what we are doing, so basically 151.80, and then we've also got 151.70. That's in the very, very short term. Um, but then, you know, Ron, as I said, we are pro we'd probably target this low here, so just above, around about kind of 151.10, maybe even down to 159.90. So hopefully that, um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, FX Street, sorry, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intervene here. I think it's easier not to say 9 a.m. GMT. I would put it as 10 o'clock BST. Um, I just think that's much easier, um, especially for UK clients. But I know not everyone here is from the UK, so, so maybe um, you guys see that. But hopefully it's local time, right, for each one. So let's just uh, let's move on to that. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, I've obviously mentioned uh, the pound uh, being weighed down by economic data. Likewise, with the euro being weighed down in economic data, we actually saw a weaker than expected PMI uh, from the UK today and much weaker than expected um, mortgage approval. So I know some of you won't be, um, I know some of you uh, won't, uh, I know some of you won't, um, is that some of you kind of maybe don't follow the, the economic data, but the market, that's what the market is digesting at the moment. Remember the first week of the month um, is, uh, the first week of the month um, is is obviously um, is obviously a big one for economic data and also for central banks. So that's kind of a key thing. Um, Ron's just asked me to repeat some levels. I said 150, like it's certainly in the short term. Uh, we've got one foot 151 uh, around about this kind of 150 90 level, which is this double bottom from here. But there's some interim support as well. So in the very very short term, we think that uh, 151 80 and then 151 70. 151.90, sorry, then 151.75. Uh, there's some hourly moving averages. They should act as fairly good support as well. So I would say certainly interim support. Um, Uh, the rest of them is interim support. Uh, really pleased that FX Street just gave me that clarification on GMT there. Um, but we also have um, we also have some kind of longer term supports there at 150.90, and then we also have uh, someone just said 149.80. Um, I think that 149.80 would probably only come into play if we get a negative or if we get a surprise, maybe a QE surprise from. Um, from the Bank of England on Thursday. Um, I ju the reason why I think that I think that there's a lot of kind of there's been a lot of some unwinding of um, there's been some unwinding of um, of uh, there's been some unwinding of, of some sterling shorts. They've got very overextended on the downside. Um, so you know what we've seen really is uh, is kind of positioning help bolster the pound at the moment and we're not seeing extend gains but we're just seeing like you know potentially around about below 150 really looks like a good low especially below 149 um, so there is a possibility I think to 149.81 but I think we're going to have to see a bit of a surprise from the Bank of England first um, you know no, no QE expected let me just uh, double check that obviously I've been away as well for this uh, holiday, so I'm hoping that uh, yeah, no no QE expected, no rate cut, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We think probably if there was something going to happen, there'd probably be more um, uh, QE rather than a rate cut. Uh, remember, rates are already very low at 0.5 percent, so they're already in negative territory. And um, there is a chance for maybe another 50 billion of QE. And um, we have seen um, some mixed economic data. For me, what will be the clincher is uh, will be PMI services sector data. 
which will come out on um, Thursday as well. So it's going to be cutting it a bit short. The market expects a slight decrease to 51.5 from March from 51.8. If we were to see a real plunge in that, I think that's going to be the problem. Um, now, one thing, there was some good news actually in the pound which hasn't really digested, which the, but the market hasn't really digested. But it looks like we are, oh, there you go, we're through, through 152 now. So we're extending that decline, quite a sharp move lower. And the reason why is that I think we're kind of gaining a little bit of strength on the, on the the dollar. Uh, let's just take a quick look then now at the dollar index. I just want to show you this. Uh, let's take a look here. Uh, this is dollar index. Um, and I'm going to just go literally to the daily chart. And yes, as you can see, the dollar index has made up some gains. I want to show you kind of the just the four-day chart, really. Yesterday, we saw a sharp decline in the dollar. And the main reason for that was that we got some very weak economic data from the U.S. But really, the markets, I'm just using this just to show you how the markets are really being, you know, the, the, the pace is really being set in the first week of every month when we're in these, fu these fundamental markets, largely because the key economic data is released the first week of every month, and we also have these um, economic, um, these central bank meetings. So what we saw yesterday was the dollar sell-off on the back of a weaker than expected is a manufacturing report for March. And yet today what we're seeing is a nice recovery as people kind of digest the fact that, well, actually things are terrible in Europe um, and the UK. So it's kind of been a bit like a game of tennis. Um, you know, the, the, there's been a lot of surprises and we're kind of, we're, there's been a lot of economic data surprises and the market is, very, is reacting to that. So it's not really sticking to one theme. It's reacting very much to the data as it comes out. And I think that's largely because, you know, there have been talks, talk about, you know, talk about recovery for so long. People just expect the Eurozone to do badly, I think. Um, likewise, I think the UK, there's a little bit more fluctuation there. But in the US, I think the real key thing there is, you know, can this recovery be sustained into the second quarter, into the third quarter? That's going to be key for what the, what the Federal Reserve is doing. So that's why we're seeing the pound, we're seeing the dollar, sorry, and this is the dollar index and the dollar against its largest trading partners, um, really, to find it very sticky to, to extend gains above the 83 level because right now there is more QE going on. Um, oh, someone's asked me to slow down. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Ron, yes, I did mention 150.80. That is correct as support on the downside for cable. So I'm, I'm, I'm done with cable now. I'm going to be moving on slightly. Uh, but 150.80 should be good support. And that was a double bottom just from the earlier this week. So with the dollar index, this is, you know, we are, we are basing. We've based around 82.50. But we have got, as you can see, very, very, uh, very key and very easy to recognize uh, tops and bottoms there. I also want to show you the point and figure chart. So I haven't used these for a while. I haven't. Um, use these in this webinar for a while. Um, the reason being, but, well, there's no reason being really. I just haven't. Um, but as you can see here, um, you know the. What I really like about the, the point of figure is that this is a historical chart. So it, it basically strips out time and looks purely at, at price. Um, the reason why is that uh, the reason why it's, it's really good is that you know it shows you key levels, and I think that's the key for a lot of retail traders out there. Right, you want your buy and your sell levels, or you want your support and your resistance levels. That's really pivotal. And you know, let's go into the intraday level. Just let it. Um, it's just going to upload a little bit. But as you can see there, you've you've got it right. We've got the top, which is the 8320 zone, and we've got the bottom here, which is this kind of age 250 zone. So that's the short term range that the dollar is trading in against its major trading partners. In the longer term, they would look at kind of 84 uh, down to about kind of 79. So really, we are still trading in quite a, bear, a bullish um, position in the euro, even though it is, um, even though it is, um, is kind of, a, you know, it had made quite lows of the day yesterday. So, uh, so that's certainly worth watching, watching out for there. And I think the dollar index is going to be really pivotal or where the dollar goes in the short to medium term is going to be um, absolutely vital um, for things like dollar yen, which Michael wants me to look at, which I'll gladly do. Just bear with me one moment. Let me just pull up my chart. So dollar yen, massive week for dollar yen. Obviously, we've got that Bank of Japan meeting coming up tomorrow, uh, third and fourth. Yeah, so that's tomorrow and Thursday. Thursday night, our time. Thursday night, our time. Um, and we are, um, uh, sorry, Wednesday night, our time. I do apologize. Um, and that will be... Um, 
really keenly watched. Remember, new governor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, where do we stand? Well, what we've seen is um, what we've seen is um, ninety kind of a sharp drop actually in dollar yen we saw a sharp drop yesterday look at that big long candlestick there uh, that was down to um, that was down to uh, a, a, a few things really but largely that is a manufacturing data so that was down to dollar weakness and that's really the dollar has been kind of leading things in dollar yen at the moment because I think the, the, Jap the Japanese yen side of this cross is pretty much waiting for um, the Bank of Japan. Now, what, hence why we've seen it kind of recover today. So it's got back above that 93 level, but it had been at, you know, some of its lowest levels for a while, actually. Its lowest levels really since kind of February, so in a month. So that was quite a significant move that we've seen there. It looks like we could just be forming a bottom there around about 93.20. But going forward, um, we will need to, uh, but going forward, I think, you know, the key thing will be whether or not... Um, we see um, will we'll be on the Bank of Japan. So, uh, you know, it will be whether or not they can deliver on these huge promises of massive stimulus to continue to weaken the yen. Uh, we tend to think that maybe they won't. Maybe there's a, a quite a big risk of disappointment. Um, so where could we go from here? Where, where are the downside? Where's the downside, really? Where's the support level? Well, 91.5 uh, or kind of between kind of 91.5 and, and, and 92 is going to be a massive support zone. It really is. If we get below there, I think a lot of people will reassess their long dollar yen positions. Now, I think, you know, overall, they're going to, you know, the Bank of Japan are, they certainly are committed to stimulus, for sure. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> they're certainly committed to stimulus, for sure, but it's whether or not, you know, stimulus has a great, powerful action uh, at the beginning of its cycle, and that was about there. That's when, when people talk about it, and they expect it, that's when it has the biggest impact. Right now, when they give it to the market, um, it can sometimes kind of lose its bite and we've seen that with the dollar many times over the recent years um, whereby we've seen the dollar actually uh, sell off once there's been the announcement of QE. Now that's what we could see with dollar with, with the yen basically, the yen actually strengthen um, after, after weakening quite sharply on the back of um, expected QE and massive very aggressive QE uh, what we could see as well here uh, is basically what that means for dollar yen, it's just a further extension to the downside as I said, you know, 90 91.5 to 92 massive support zone, support area and then of course you've got 90 which also coincides with the 100 day moving average that's the low, that's kind of the, the low of 2013 too so you know there would be a lot of significance and it's a whole number so it's psychologically important um, in a kind of shorter term, though, uh, you know, we've got some good uh, support or good resistance zones on the way up to 93.50 and then towards kind of 93.80. And I would really see us trading in that range, maybe 92.80 to 93.80 as we lead up to those Bank of, that Bank of Japan meeting. Now, again, uh, even if they announce something that's not as aggressive as expected, you'll know straight away because the dolly M will dip pretty sharply. Um, so hopefully you find that, you guys, you find that useful. And I haven't been talking too fast. I hope not. But uh, but certainly on a um, on an hourly chart, this uh, this RSI suggests that kind of at the moment uh, anything below kind of 93, or below like 92.80 is looking really oversold. Um, so that's why you know it did attract some buyers. So we, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of people picking up the dips, and that's really what we've seen the whole way uh, with dollar yen since we got to those kind of 97 highs. It's been it's not gone down a straight line. It's been a little bit jagged. You know, like here we saw kind of people buying dips, buying dips. Maybe they're going to buy the dips here, but really you know the long term direction it's all up to the Bank of Japan now so there'll be a lot of squaring of positions ahead of that and then people will be kind of going for going lower uh, someone's just said Ron's just asked do I see dollar index going to 84 in the weeks ahead well I'll just show you that dollar index chart again because you know obviously 84 is a really significant level just drag this over here um, just get it up Dollar index really significant. 84 is a massively significant level because it's the highest from July. I think there is a chance it could. I mean, look, there's been real congestion here at 83, and the market doesn't seem to like staying above it too much. Nice double top there. Um, but we have got quite a key reversal pattern here around about 82, around around about 82 and a half. So what we could see is, you know, a prolonged um, period of, of stronger economic data could help that. However, Ron, do watch out for dollar yen uh, because obviously 
obviously if dollar yen does start to weaken on the back of uh, Japan being less dovish, the Bank of Japan being less dovish than expected, then the dollar index can get hit, largely because Japan's a big trading partner of, of the US, and so it makes up a large constituent part of the dollar index, dollar yen does. Um, so it can sometimes be impacted not just by what's been going on, not just what's going on with the US fundamentally, uh, but also what's going on elsewhere. So uh, I would say 84, I think there's a potent, I, th- I, I can definitely see it because I think the recovery is going ahead. I think, you know, we could certainly be in a position whereby the dollar is going to continue to extend gains. I would expect that uh, because I do think that it's in a better, a better shape than the Japan or, or the Europe or any parts of Europe, really. But equally, I do think you've got to be just a bit careful, especially as we lead up to this um, Uh, but especially to lead up to this Bank of Japan meeting. Um, Ahmed has said, um, do you know if banks pay subscription fee and get economic data like the NFP before other people? Um, actually, no. The NFP is released uh, by the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the US, so it's released at the same time and there's no and no one gets it early. What you can pay for and get early, and some banks do, some individuals do as well, is PMI data from Europe and also from the UK. Now, you may have noticed this. I've had a few people um, ring me up in a bit of a... But a bit concerned, and we're certainly getting on Twitter a bit concerned as well, largely because um, we have uh, what we've seen uh, is that you know the release actually comes out two minutes beforehand. So if you pay for the, those releases for the PMI, I think it's market that do it. You get it two minutes beforehand. Now. Uh, w- what you usually find is that Bloomberg and news feeds and things like that will release it two minutes early anyway. But don't worry, the NFP, which is released on Friday, obviously, that is not released early. So you don't need to worry about that at all. Now, I want to go back to the S&P as well, because obviously on Monday, uh, yes, no, Thursday, sorry, my fault, um, we saw a record high. Uh, in the S&P, so it finally joined that club with the Dow of reaching record highs, uh, but it didn't stay there. Obviously, yesterday was quite a negative day, was a negative day, was a down day for the market, and I'm just a little bit concerned right now. I'm going to just zoom in. Uh, there's quite a powerful top position being put in in the S&P. I know a lot of people have been talking about this, right, that, um, what you know, that, that oh, you know, where's the, if people, you know, people have been to- calling the top since we got above 1,500. Um, you'd have missed out on all this profit opportunity, etc., cetera, et cetera. But I say in the short term, beware. That's a bearish engulfing candle there um, after after kind of a positive day. And that, that does tend to be suggest that the top has been put in place. Now, these candlestick pan, patterns do always approach with caution because people see them in different ways and not everyone knows about them, not everyone plays them. Um, but, you know, obviously I think, you know, a lot of the a lot of the the real money a lot of a lot of the good money out there doesn't really want to well, probably won't want to um, get in at the low, at the high at the record highs they're going to probably look for pullbacks obviously 1550 being a very good uh, support zone now we've seen some mixed uh, performance today in Europe um, in European stock markets um, with obviously that economic data really weighing on on some markets uh, particularly the ibex and the FTSE uh, euro stocks are still higher though so uh, so there is some uh, slight positive impetus. Let me look at the futures market for you. And they are pointing to a slightly stronger open. So getting back above that um, to that kind of record high level um, in the S&P. So I would, ju- I would just be careful. I mean, you know, we've seen that you can see it just in this pattern here really since 1550, whereby we've been... Um, you know, it's been quite painful. There have been more down days, as you can see, than up days, uh, which is always a little bit painful when you when you still own at this level or you're thinking about getting in, etc., etc. In that environment, I would say, you know, if you're a short-term trader, look, there's some nice lows here around about kind of 15.45, 15.40. Um, you know, wait for the pullback because the market has shown itself to pull back. Um, keep, keep your time frames quite tight. Um, you know, right now there's not... There's a couple of things on the horizon that suggest to me this could be a, a more medium-term top. But again, I'm willing to play it out because the market's been going different directions. Um, there's, there's two things for me. Number one is that economic data could start to decline, uh, potentially in the U.S. It has done in the past. We've had this mid-year malaise thing that starts to show through in Q2. And the other thing, of course, has been... Um, 
uh, is, is the Q1 earnings season, which isn't expected to be that strong. So do watch out for that, uh, whereby earnings, corporate earnings could really topple the whole index. Um, so I am just a bit wary of that, but I'm kind of at the moment, I'm a bit agnostic. I'm trying to go where price action goes. I'm not trying to uh, just, you know, because I saw a bearish engulfing, I'm definitely going to get out. That's not the case that I'm in at the moment. Um, you know, the, the technicals have to play out, of course, uh, but I'm going to I'm going to wait on the sidelines a little bit and just see what what goes on. I think as well, you know, if we get kind of, uh, you know, if we get um, a better maybe ism non-manufacturing, that could be good news for the S and P for sure. Uh, likewise, I think we've got that NFP data as you said, like you know, another 200k plus reading, like we got in uh, February. Remember, we got it kind of around about the 8th, I think, of February of March. Sorry, uh, that led to kind of another leg higher. So I think if we get a good NFP reading, um, even though that puts QE um, in jeopardy, I think it could potentially lead us higher just a little bit. So uh, Rashida just asked, is your RSI indicator you three? values of RSI with two moving averages. Uh, no, it's, it's the fully the RSI. So RSI is made up of three different lines. So uh, you can check that out on Wikipedia and, and rather than us going through it here. So, okay, guys, uh, it's 10.30 now. I'm willing to take one question if anyone has one. Otherwise, I know I don't want to keep you. So, uh, so let me know. Let me know if anyone has... Um, any questions? Otherwise, I'll just assume that we're done. And remember, next week it'll be 10 o'clock BST, so 9 a.m. GMT. So hopefully, thanks for sorting that out, uh, FX Street. I think uh, that's probably very clear now to everyone. Um, and some great questions, as always. Uh, please do uh, keep coming to this webinar. Um, it's great chatting to you guys. And uh, good luck trading the rest of this week. Thank you.